This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Thanks for joining us in this episode of Real Talk. It's Jesperson and Hicks with you in, in just a moment. Uh, the mayor of a Soyuz BC. Johnny, you've lived in, in that general yeah, region, that beautiful general area. part of the province yeah, of beautiful. British Columbia. Is it fair to say that a Soyuz BC is one of the most beautiful spots in the entire country? Absolutely breathtaking, yes. And I'm not just saying this to butter up her worship, Mayor Sue McCordoff, who's going to join us in just a second. <laughs> uh, I was out in a Soyuz last summer. They've got a yeah. stunning golf courses. They've got stunning waterfront. They've got just an absolutely beautiful reality when they wake up every single day. But still... A bunch of people aren't feeling the love. Uh, there's a bunch of people, it doesn't matter how the sun looks when it's at the top of the sky. It doesn't matter how the water feels when they plunge in to take a break from the 28 degrees Celsius July afternoons. People are ornery and fired up okay. and in some circumstances harassing and threatening politicians. Uh, they had one city council meeting back in November, so a ways ago. They were talking about their 2024 budget. Mm-hmm. And the mayor will tell us about this in just a second. Uh, but things got absolutely bananas. And we'll show you when we're talking to her a photo of their council chambers. It's not what you might expect or what you might be used to in the so-called bigger cities. There's basically zero separation between people in the meeting and the counselors. And so when people are like leaning in on the table to like yell and scream and suggest that the you know, town officials should be dragged behind pickup trucks, like one guy suggested using his real name, by the way, uh, it's a little uh, more. It, well, it's always serious, but it feels a little bit more immediate, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. Would you imagine? Of and course. so so Mayor Sue's going to talk to us about that, but they're doing something about it. A Soyuz is pushing back. And as far as I can tell, it might be one of the first municipalities in in the entire country and so we wanted to get into this we talked to the president of alberta municipalities tyler gandam what like three weeks ago or something like yeah. that and and uh, he's the mayor of wetaskiwin you know he's the subject of recall efforts right now as well as he talked to us in the interview and remember gandam i said do you ever do you ever feel like just walking away uh talking about the abuse and the threats and 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 to his credit his candor he says yeah and what I am concerned about, most particularly, aside from, you know, potentially assaults of politicians and other public figures, and this isn't just about politicians. It could be like women working in industry or it could be people working in certain fields or uh, we're going to get to an email here from Brian in a little bit. Maybe people involved in work disputes like strikes and whatever it is, we see the temperature is up. I mean, have you seen that video? We'll track it down. That The video of, of, of the, the, the convoy, there's like another convoy, and there's a lady just absolutely losing her mind on an RCMP officer on the side of the highway. And, and the video's making the rounds, not just across the country. You guys know how the internet works. It's going all around the world, and everybody's going, this is Alberta. And I'm going, no, 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 this isn't Alberta. And I would imagine that Mayor McCordoff in a sec is going to go, this isn't B.C., and maybe it's nothing new. People getting all fired up, people not knowing how to manage their emotions, people saying things in some circumstances that they don't mean, and in other circumstances saying things that they do mean, which is why alarm bells are going off. But why does it feel like the temperature is just so much hotter right now? We're going to get into it. We'll take a look at uh, some of the... Uh, you know, stories that are making news right now. The Alberta government's going to intervene in a court case in Saskatchewan. This is the parents and the pronouns thing. Daniel Smith in an interview with our buddy Rick Bell, the dinger, the columnist out of Calgary. You know, nobody writes like Rick Bell. He's got a, a, a very unique writing style. He's just spoken to Alberta's premier. She says that Alberta's going to step in. Alberta's going to stop. They're going to do everything they can to stop deals between Ottawa and municipalities. They don't want to see any more direct deals. You remember when the prime minister was here talking to us in our studio on February 21st? What was he here to do? He was here making housing announcements that the feds had struck deals that Ottawa had struck directly with the cities and the cities right now in our home province of Alberta. I won't, I don't think they want us saying that they're fighting with the province, but, but what is that like in a marriage when they're not fighting, the spouses aren't fighting. They're just like not even talking to each other. They haven't slept in the same bed in three years. They don't have dinner together. They don't socialize together. They're not fighting, but it ain't good. 
That's the relationship between the province and municipalities in Alberta right now. So the province is saying, essentially, pardon my French, they're going to cock block deals between the feds and the municipalities. The province wants in on it. They say that the Ottawa is circumventing the province for political reasons, which is probably true. And maybe part of the reason why Alberta's getting in there and getting its nose in there is for, oh, I don't know, political reasons as well. So we'll take a look at that. Plus, the emails have not stopped following our conversation about that horrific tragedy that happened in Edmonton. That beautiful 11-year-old boy, his whole life ahead of him, mauled and killed by two Cane Corso dogs owned by his dad's roommate, Cash Grist. And, and I, I got a text from a buddy on my phone five minutes before we started doing this show. We've got more emails from, from Colin and, and one from Jared that just stopped me in my tracks. Uh, because we read an email about dogs from Jared on this show back in December, and he follows up. There was a part of the story he told us, and there was a part of the story that he didn't. And in the context of what's happened here in Edmonton and this tragedy that the entire country is talking about, people are looking at their own jurisdictions going, what should we do about dog attacks, fatal dog attacks, so-called dangerous breeds? And I understand that members of this Real Talk audience are coming at this from a ton of different angles. Some of you were attacked by dogs, you've been telling us when you were kids. Others of you are dog trainers. Others of you are breeders. Others of you have had bad experience with puppy mills. Some of you own pit bulls and Dobermans and boxers like me and Rottweilers and, and other big dogs that can have a bad reputation. You know them to be puppy dogs, the ones that your kids lay on. And I'm not making fun of you because those are the exact same things we say about our dog. And that's the exact same thing that the people including Cash's dad, said about those two King Corsos right up until the attack happened. It's a gut-wrenching interview, the one that he did. I just feel sick for everybody. I feel sick for everybody. The dad said the whole time he was here, Cash had been there for like a week, visiting from a Soyuz. We're going to ask the mayor about him. He said the dogs were with him all week. They were laying together all week. So we're going to get to more of your emails. I wouldn't, we're not going to stick on this story if you don't want to keep talking about it, but you do. And so we're going to do that before the show is out. Plus, my Jasper memories, Jasper's Pride Festival is coming up soon. And of course, uh, they're getting ready to go into big time celebration mode. Nobody does Pride quite like Jasper, and that'll be coming up midway through today's show. The show doesn't happen. Without the support of our friends at Rello, and they've got a pretty quick and concise message for you, and that is if you're sick of what you're doing for work right now, if you're absolutely fed up with the cubicle life, your boss doesn't appreciate you, your earning is capped, you don't see a way out, there's no pathway to promotion. A career in real estate could be a perfect fit for you, and nobody does real estate school. Nobody prepares folks for a career in real estate in Alberta better than Rello. That's R-E-L-O dot C-A. People love Rello because they've got online instructors and courses designed to fit your schedule. They help you write your exam. They help you get certified. And then the help doesn't stop there. You're going to continue to receive good advice as you need it. At Rello, they're all about value. That's why there's course extras attached to basically every single course they offer. Best part about it for you, because you're hearing about it, seeing it on Real Talk, you're going to save 20% off any Rello course right now by using the promo code Real Talk. That's a big deal, 20% off. All one word, Real Talk, when you visit Rello.ca. Uh, mayor Sue McCordoff uh, joining us live from beautiful Soyuz, BC. Uh, longtime mayor there, uh, if, if my research holds true. Mayor, you've won three straight elections, haven't you? You've been doing the job for a while. Uh, yes, good morning, uh, Ryan. And first of all, I'm going to tell you that you're pronouncing Osuyas wrong. Oh. And so that's my first lesson. And the easy way to remember is the mayor's name is Sue. So you say Osuyas. Osuyas. My yes. sincere apologies. I have an immense amount of respect and wonder for your community. I absolutely love it in Asuyas. Um, can I put yes. you on the spot? And I suspect that you're probably prepared for the question. Um, what, what is the history of the name Asuyas? Like, what does it mean? What does it reflect? What can we learn about your community? Well, it's really Suyus, which is the narrowing of the waters uh, because our lake is divided into sort of two main areas. And it's uh, it's an Okanagan Indian, um, uh, Suyus Indian band. It's it's based on 
and a lot of the of the names in the Okanagan are based on on native uh, terms. So that's where it came from, Suyus. Oh, beautiful. Well, I appreciate the correction. Um, we're here to talk to you about <laughs> about what your community is doing, what your council is doing, that the temperature and the vibe of politics. But uh, probably the num the number one return on news searches on Google searches for a Suyus uh, in the news this week is is that 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 wonderful, promising, bright eyed little boy, eleven years old, uh, that lost his life in Edmonton uh, visiting right. for spring break, just a horrific tragedy. D d did you happen? I mean, our thoughts are with your entire community. Um, I understand that his schoolmates are, are receiving uh, mental health resources, but, but something like this, especially in a relatively smaller community like yours, uh, can send absolute shockwaves. Uh, what can you tell us? So, um, Honestly, I didn't know anything about it because mm. um, Cash has and his mother have only lived in our community since November. Ah. So they've only been here a couple of months and I'm not sure where they came from before. Um, I was a teacher at the school, the elementary school, for 35 years. So I certainly um, am familiar with the school. But when somebody phoned me, um, CBC phoned me to ask about it, I didn't I hadn't heard. All I had seen on the news was that it was in Edmonton. So it wasn't the Asuya's connection that I um, that I I knew about right away. But there have been um, the mother is here. I understand in town. Uh, I assume I I haven't met her. Um, but there is a GoFundMe page that has been set up, and they have raised some uh, some money, quite a bit of money, I believe, to help um, with the burial for uh for cash yeah so that's that's all i know and when somebody phoned me i said gee if, if it's a student at, at our school could you phone the principal and i'm assuming that's what they did and found superintendent and uh and they knew about it but um had not been here very long so i didn't know the name at all and um and oh it's very very sad of course yeah i mean i i just i don't know i feel like my heart's been heavy the whole week uh mm -hmm. you know in learning about this for obvious reasons i would say i'm a dad but i, I don't even know that the, i guess it's relevant in a way but i think anybody can can feel the pain on yes, this one absolutely. Um, yeah people can go we've been putting the gofundme in our show notes for the last week or so people can find it uh, or just by googling funeral costs for cash grist that's k a c h e they've raised about 31,000 of their goal yes. of 40,000 to help as well with with mental health counseling for the family uh, mayor do you happen to know off the top of your head what your community or, or what surrounding communities if you have any legislation bylaws around things like uh so-called dangerous dog breeds dog attacks is that an issue in in, in your neck of the woods well uh, we have had a few incidents not anything as serious as this of course but we do have a bylaw uh on dangerous dogs and it's outlined in there it's a couple of years old um, and I think we probably need to look at it again, but at least we have something there and our bylaw officers are aware of this. And um, sometimes if you if your dog has attacked somebody or has proven that they're not able to control um, themselves, they need to go out with a muzzle. Uh, but, you know, it's I think since the last incident where another dog was attacked, I think we have done this and uh, we probably need to look at it again because th things like that bylaws need to be updated periodically. Mm. Yeah, I appreciate but you. We do have something. Yeah, I yeah. appreciate you taking the question. I think in, in a, you know, a situation like this, people start. Uh, I didn't even know, uh, quite frankly, uh, what the laws were, what the rules were in my own city. And, and unfortunately, mm -hmm. sometimes the way that we're wired and the way our attention spans go, you know, it's not until tragedy happens that we start yes. to level up our understanding. But certainly a lot of people are talking about this and thinking about this. We've, we've received like dozens yeah. of emails this week about yeah. this no you know. it's very very sad yeah, yeah. Uh, mayor we, we didn't ask you to come on to talk about that i appreciate you taking the question w wanted to ask about something that's coming <laughs> up uh, at the end of this month obviously uh you your fellow uh your, your colleagues on council are, are basically appealing to other municipalities you're going to local governance boards and and maybe taking this beyond and we can get into the details and the minutiae in a little bit uh but you've basically had enough of uh, having your colleagues threatened at City yeah. Hall, right? I mean, like that's what it all comes down to in one sentence. Well, it's been very um, unfortunate. The We started off by having quite a large tax increase, which seemed to spur everybody without reading the whys and wherefores into, uh, into, well, we don't do that. We don't like it. And so we're going to object 
violently. And uh, there have been lots of things on social media sites that, um, that have been nasty, defamatory, threatening. Uh, and, you know, and so we kind of try to deal with it. But I, we had to go further than that. We had to say, we sent a letter to SILGA, which is our Southern Interior Local Government Association, where we're going at the end of the month. And we said, we'd like to put forth a resolution. And, uh, and you know, it's just, we, we'd done a, a little, uh, you know, background information that uh, the frequency and severity of personal and defamatory attacks towards municipal leaders, including council and staff, uh, through various channels have created a hostile working environment and hindered the ability for us to do our duties effectively. The repercussions extend beyond the municipal realm and can detrimentally affect council members who are working professionals in our community. And uh, they often infiltrate the, the personal lives of both staff and municipal council members, including incidents like at the grocery store where people you know, are given the finger or, um, which is, you know, totally disgusting. And I'm not saying that it's everybody, but there's enough that it's an uncomfortable thing. Let me tell you, I think it has um, died down uh, quite a bit recently, and I'm hoping it continues to be that way. We have made some, uh, some uh, you know, changes to our tax increases, we have lowered it. It's not, it's never gonna be perfect. Who likes to pay higher taxes? We get it, but we're all in the same boat and we need to make sure that we are looking after our community and people were up in arms last year because of our water situation and we have brown water, that's a whole other issue, but it's because of the manganese in the water and interior health tells us that we have to add chlorine. Chlorine precipitates out the manganese and you get brown water. So we need to do a whole ton of things to help uh, make our water better, but nobody wants to pay extra for that, even though our tax, our, our water rates and so on are lower than many other places, but it's not what they've been used to. So those things have been... <clears throat> Um, very concerning. A couple of our council members have businesses in town and they're having a tough time dealing with things. They've done well. They've explained to people who want to listen what's happening and why they should read. Our, our CAO, who's just an absolute gem, has gone through and answered every single thing on the budget increases put it, um, talked about it, made slides, put it on our website. Um, many people, thank heavens, have contacted us and said, thank you for that. That really explains what the concerns are and how you're going to address it. So, um, you know, the, the other thing we did was, well, I wrote a letter to the paper last week and just said that I was very upset about what was going on. And uh, and I thought it was totally inappropriate. We live in a beautiful community with lots of wonderful people. And let's get together and be a positive, welcoming community where we support each other and show kindness to all. <clears throat> and unfortunately, when we look <clears throat> all across the country and in the United States, um, there is a lack of kindness and there's a lack of civility and a lack of of uh, of working together and helping one another and making this a better place. So we've written to UBCM, uh, which is the Union of BC Municipalities, um, where we will meet in Vancouver in September, the 178 municipalities across BC. And, uh, and we just said, we'd like to put forth, uh, you know, um, um, you know, we'd like support for the resolution asking for legislative changes to um to develop comprehensive comprehensive proposals for legislative form and uh, reform and you know we've talked to several of our ministers uh that that are that are in the government they're very supportive of well as well so i'm thinking that might be a good thing and since this was sent out this letter about a month ago to all the municipalities 
we've heard from several who absolutely feel the same way and are happy to support it. In lay, so that's in, a good, yeah, that's a good thing. Uh, great synopsis, by the way. In in layperson's language, w- w- what would you like to see? Like, you just want you want laws with more teeth for people who abuse public officials. You want bigger consequences. Like, w- w- you know, w- w- essentially, what would you like to see happen? Well, we've done locally some um, local uh, council procedure amendments so that if somebody does not follow our code of conduct, which we have for everybody and most places do have this, then we have the ability to ask them to um, to leave. And if they do not, uh, they wish, and we haven't had that happen yet, so we're okay. But um, if they do not, then um, we would, we would, our end result is we could call the police and they're on board with us too. We don't ever want to come to that stage, but um, we have had gone through and made these procedural, uh, procedural amendments to allow this to happen. And, uh, and it's gone through the proper procedure and it's now enacted. So, um, we'll see. Mayor, we'll I think, see, uh, uh, so we'll, we'll have people watching this on YouTube. Most people will listen to it on the podcast. So for, for our podcast listeners, we, we got to describe what the YouTube listeners are going to, uh, watchers are going to see here, these viewers. But like, so this, I think is a photo, uh, we'll, we'll uh, credit the Times Chronicle who's done a good job reporting mm-hmm. on this, but this is a photo, I think of your November 23rd council meeting that I'm showing yes, on my screen is. right now. Yes. And, and basically the, the people are like, uh, you can like what people are like breathing down your necks. Like there's no... I don't know if the fella in the, in the all black is maybe a security guard or something, but there's like there people can get way too, way too close to you guys. He he's there for a reason. He's, he's, uh, he's um, there to, to, to sort of help us. He's not one of the, of the, the public that was in too. He looks like a guy, he looks like a guy that can handle his business, but, but for, for context, let me just say, and I'm just cherry picking one Facebook comment from one post. Okay. There's more than one, but there's a guy using his real name by the name of Liam Brennan, uh, who comments on a town of Asuyu's post that says, when I'm back home, I will literally, he's talking about your town CAO, right? He's talking about an, uh, an official with the town. He says, when I'm home, I will literally find that grease ball, hook a chain around his ankle and drag him behind my pickup truck back to Alberta. Like if I'm the CAO of the town of Asuyus, um, I'm not showing up to the meeting if I don't know or can guarantee that Liam Brennan's not going to be in that meeting 15 feet away from me. Do you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. That's pretty disgusting. And that was why I I said after I, I heard that, because I don't go on uh, Asuya's Connect and read those. And my friends say, Sue, don't do it. They're yeah, nasty. Don't. You don't need to hear that. You don't need to see it. And so I don't. However, I did hear about that comment and about several of the others. And that's why I wrote the letter to the editor and why I went on a council meeting. And I said, this is totally inappropriate and uncalled for and it will not happen and i have to tell you our cao i've I've talked i talk to him all the time want to make sure that he knows that we appreciate what what he's doing for us and um and i get the same kind of comments as well i know that so i but that one was picked up and posted and i'm glad his name is out there that is absolutely disgusting but you know, some of our of our um, our town staff have uh, resigned, and they're looking for other jobs. I and, just wanted to ask you about that. Yeah. I mean, like, and what what about you? Like a three term mayor? What about you? And and probably people I don't know your council too well, but folks that are doing a good job. You know, you 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 try to attract the right kind of people to politics. Uh-huh. They come from all different backgrounds, and and this type of thing. People go, why the hell would I ever want to participate in that? Well, I've lived in this town. I've supported this town. I've worked in the town for over 50 years. I am not going to be intimidated by people who uh, are not being considerate or polite. They're just being downright rude and and nasty. I have a a job to do. I've been in, in on town council since 2011. Uh, as a councillor first and then three-time mayor, uh, I am not going to say, I don't like these things, I'm going to walk away. Not a chance.
Mayor, uh, can I ask, do you know what happened with that specific comment? Our live chat just exploded. Everybody's like, we're assuming that would have been passed along to RCMP, something like that. I mean, that's a direct threat to bodily harm. Did you know that they investigate that comment? I do know that the RCMP know about it. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and the, the, I'm I don't know past that. That's not that's not my job to know that. No. But I I certainly understand. And certainly we're a small town. We're, you know, fifty five hundred people. Um, we everybody knows everything. And uh the people and, and actually in the Asuis Times this week there's an article by by Don Urquhart and he has a photo shot of that of exactly that um screenshot shot. So right. we it it's awful. We are hoping that things are starting to improve a bit. We passed the budget yesterday, the final budget. Congratulations. That's, that's been adopted. So you know, now we move forward and we see um, how we can make things work and how we can all work together. And, uh, you know, I feel kind of positive about this, not about some of the awful things that go on, but the fact that I think we're starting to to go in the right direction. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, congrats on passing that budget. Do you, do you mind me? What, what was the... Uh... Uh, you, you said, you know, a significant property tax increase. We try, sort of try to uh, see where people are at across the country in Alberta. It's not unusual to see six, seven, eight, nine percent increases on property taxes. What's a Sioux is looking at right now? Well, for one thing, a one percent increase in property taxes is equal to thirty two thousand ah. dollars. Doesn't go far. So. Uh, you know, somebody says a 5%, that's horrible. Well, that gives you 150,000 bucks. And how, what does that buy you? Not even put in a new washroom. So um, we have most of our tax increase was water and sewer rates, which are user rates. And so we have agreed that we should take those out and just deal with the municipal tax, which is about 10% right now that's about 10 percent. so you know what that doesn't give us a whole ton of money either but it works um we we will continue to try and educate and tell people um what this means when you say a tax increase and we'll try and do water and sewer rates the the what we've asked for is a report on looking at how we can break those up and maybe um send them out three times a year or something rather than have everything come on one tax notice which has been what we've done um previously mm. and we think we'll need to change that but people can pay their taxes any any time they want um we encourage that you don't have to come in on July the 1st and pay your taxes you can you can come in monthly and do it and we offer that option as well that people can pay on a monthly basis which makes it easier for many do you happen to know who Kathy Heron is mayor of St Albert in Alberta does the I name don't. ring a bell? She was the president of Alberta municipalities up until a short time ago. Anyway, she's given she's she's given you quite the compliments here in our live chat on YouTube. Uh, so mayor's tuned in here out of St. Albert, but she's sharing a little bit about her experience as well. She says the RCMP has limited response. Uh, Mayor Heron says I had similar threats a few years back, uh, required an escort to and from my office for several weeks. Um, is that the type of thing? I mean, what's uh, do, do you have like no. police detail, stuff like that or? Uh, the police uh, in the area are very good. Our bylaw officers are very are very good and supportive. I I don't feel that way. I guess maybe I've been here um, long enough that people most people know me. I have uh, very good friends in the community. Um, as I said, I was a teacher. One of our newer counselors was in my class in grade three. Oh wow! He said, he saw, yeah. So you know, um, I, I certainly go to the stores and and do all the things. I've always been a really big volunteer in uh, in our community. So I'm well known for that, and I I think that perhaps helps people to understand then I'm not the bad guy. I'm there to help, and I always have been. So I'm hoping that that 
is to my advantage. A uh, bit of a weird question here, uh, because I understand that, that elected officials are always trying to keep the, the mill rate increases or the property tax increases as low as possible for the most part. Um, and But there's also the realities you describe. I mean, a 5% property tax increase, 150 Gs. I mean, that's basically not what are you going to do with that, like you said. Uh, you mentioned that the, the tax increase was, was, was up here, and then your colleagues, you managed to get it down a little bit. Now, here's the weird question. Did you have mixed feelings about that in the sense that it may be perceived as a win and maybe set precedent for the people that are threatening, for example, to drag the CAO behind a pickup truck with a chain around his ankles? Like, in other words, if somebody yells and, you know, if my child yells and screams at me, which he never does because he's an angel, but if he did, (laughs) and then I lost lost my backbone on my parenting and I reneged on, uh, you know, something I had said, then it sets a dangerous precedent, right? Well, many of the issues that we had included in the budget have been moved to uh, to 2025. So, you know, guess what? We are going to have to face this again. But, um, but, you know, uh, maybe having gone through this once, maybe people will... Um, understand more easily what um, what we're doing and why we're doing it. But at this point, we're not jumping into the next round of negotiations anytime soon. Yeah. We we need to get this this done and on board and and build people up and make sure that our staff feel absolutely um, supported because they are. We have a wonderful staff here, and I want to make sure that we retain them because how, we need them and they need us. How's the how's the relationship either with Suyus in, in particular or generally speaking with municipalities and the province of British Columbia, the provincial government? Is it a healthy really one? Really good. Yeah. <clears throat> really good. We have, um, we meet with them. And of course, since COVID, we've done a lot of meetings and a lot more meetings on Zoom or online. And so, you know, uh, I mean, I've met with uh, three or four of the ministers um, in the last couple of weeks at various events. And uh, and you know what? We know each other um, first name basis oftentimes, and um, they understand the situation. They're very supportive and and uh, obviously wanting to help us as well. So I, I can't say enough about the good relationship we have with other municipalities because I'm a director on the regional district which is our area the so- southern south okanagan uh, Similkameen and okanagan and um and we're and we have a good relationship and we work together and that's how we get things done and how we appreciate what other people do by working together and together we're better mm. Uh, all I can think about it, when you're talking, I mean, this is just where my brain goes, Okanagan, Similkameen, Valley. all I can think of is like some of the finest wines in the entire country are coming well, out of we, your backyard. We hope so, because we've had a bit of a rough go, and many of the vines have been killed with the very cold weather that, mm. what, that we had in uh, January. And the same with a lot of our fruit trees. So we're going to have to play a, you know, a waiting game. But we always had the earliest fruit the best wines and everything here. I mean, we, yeah, it's, it's paradise. <laughs> yeah. Well, Hey, uh, you don't have to tell me that. I know that. Yeah. Every, I, I hate leaving your community. Put it that way, mayor. Uh, this is the first time we've ever spoken. Uh, keep it up. Uh, you're a real impressive uh, person. Obviously I, I'm, I'm, I'm the son of a teacher as well. Oh. And so you, you can always tell a teacher from a mile away. Uh, <laughs> so, so appreciate your public service on, on, on behalf of your constituents and appreciate your availability bright and early. We always recognize people yes. in the Pacific time zone that join us live in the morning, you know. Well, thank you very much, Ryan. Thank you for asking me to be on, and I appreciate it. Yeah, you got it. That's uh, Mayor Sue McCortoff, uh, the mayor of Asuyus, Asuyus, BC. I'm glad I'm going to finally stop sounding like Yeah, you got got corrected early in the show today. Yeah, I mean, (laughs) of all the things I could have been corrected on, it was good that it wasn't like I didn't butcher her last name or something like that. But uh, yeah, Lauren says, uh, great guest. People were were digging what she had to say, which I appreciate. Bunny Slippers says, uh, you know, being an asshole really takes a lot of energy. Being a decent human doesn't take much effort at all. Yeah, but also no, Mm. in the sense that I feel like sometimes like the mayor comes on here and you can kind of tell how she rolls. She's a mix of like, I I think she strikes me having only spoken with her for for a half hour, but she strikes me as like a real no nonsense, like I'm not going anywhere. You're not going to intimidate me type of person. Um, But also someone that's like, calm and measured and reasonable which i think is probably a character trait that comes with being a teacher for 35 years Mm -hmm. but i do think that that 
people that are either working to maintain or restore decency in politics Bunny slippers. I take the spirit of your comment absolutely, but I think those people are having to work harder. Oh, I actually yeah. think it's These easier. Days, yeah. I think it's way easier to be an absolute jerk because it's what plays right now. Yeah. Well, it's going further than that right now, right? And if let's say we look to the states with all the gun violence right now, we always look back when these things happen and say, "Look at what this person was posting. Look at the threatening remarks they were making. Look at the Facebook and Twitter, you know, groups they were in." And then we say we're going to do better. But then when someone like this mayor comes on, you know, you get a few, they're in our chat today saying, you know, well, pushback is, is expected. Pushback is expected, but threatening to drag someone be behind a truck. Yeah. And then God forbid something like that happens. And we look back and say, well, they said they, they were going to do I it. Mean, that person used the word literally. I mean, that's, that's why we need to get rid of this yeah. stuff. You and know? Th that was Horse Lake Ranch that said in the chat, we appreciate your engagement. It says people are being taxed out of house and home, threatening people's bad, but pushback on a tax increase should be expected of course I, and, and actually sounds I don't, like he agrees with her though i don't really because... <laughs> i don't really disagree with anything that horse lake ranch is saying there uh, people are feeling uh, and and the reality is is that taxes are going up across the board gases we we all know this and it's not just taxes it's expenses and we talk about it all the time it's everywhere uh, i almost feel like maybe we're talking about it too much and then other days i go maybe we're not talking about it enough the affordability crisis uh, for a lot of people uh you know it's a tagline for a lot of other people it is a daily grind you know parents that are trying to figure out what they're going to feed their kids or they're adding water to the milk and the cereal or they're foregoing paying the power bill to make sure that they can send the kid on the field trip or vice versa you get it i mean a lot of you that are listening to this show that's your experience and so we don't take that lightly and we can all agree that threats are just the most moronic approach to this and that there should be accountability like, I mean, I just, I, I, I sort of laugh at someone like Liam Brennan, who goes on a, using his real name and leaves a threat that he's going to literally track down a public official, mm -hmm. the chief administrative officer of the town of Asuyus, and drag that, quote, that grease ball with a chain behind mm -hmm. a pickup truck. Like, you know, and so uh, when, it talk, when, when we talk about pushback on tax increases, I understand if the tax, you know, like, you know, this isn't happening right now because city councils can't afford this. Uh, and to bring this back to Alberta right now, this relationship between the province and the municipalities is broken. You got the mayor of Edmonton yesterday, Amarjeet Sohi. Yeah. You know, we're talking early April here, depending on when you listen to this show, basically saying the province isn't paying its property taxes. Like the province owes the city of Edmonton. That's just one example. Millions of dollars. And the cities can't do shit about it. They can't run deficit budgets. They can't borrow like the province or the feds can, right? And so they're left in a situation where they got to own these. To and I'm not carrying water for city councilors, but they got to make tough decisions because they know that the only number that people care about, I'm guilty of it, right? What did I just ask the mayor? What was the property tax? I'm looking mm -hmm. for the number. Yeah. Uh, was it 7.1? How does that stack up against 8.9 or mm -hmm. 6.4? But there's no context, Right. When she starts talking about the water treatment stuff that they need to do, mm -hmm. maybe there needs to be better communication. Maybe, 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 you know, councils need to be able to say to their constituents, listen, like, you know, and it's hard to do because budgets are big and boring. We know that. <laughs> right. Like, when's the last time anybody actually read through an entire budget before going into the comments section? Nobody does it. But we don't understand most times, I don't think, why those increases are happening. And so, you know, if Asuyus is going to say to its residents and to visitors, quite frankly, the reason why we got to have this property tax increase is so the water's not polluted and your kids can drink out of the tap, then I don't know if the appropriate response to that, a pushback, fine. I don't know if the appropriate response to that is threatening murder. Uh, yeah, of course. And yeah, it's all fun and games till someone gets hurt. Why is Kyle in the chat? If you can't handle the heat, don't step into the fire. That's such we're, a we're talking comment. about that, though. You're going to prevent people from going into politics, from going into communities and trying to help, you know. So, I mean, yeah, yeah. Push back on anything nowadays, especially when it bumps up your your costs at home is going to be expected. But threats. I mean, these are the things we have to take seriously nowadays because people do take take their. Uh, Take their opinions into their own hands and do yeah. do crazy what? stuff. And this is, again, like I just said, it's preventing people, people in politics now who are, are thinking to get out and people who want to get in who are just like, why would I even do why it? Why would you? You know? You know, I can't imagine why you'd want to. Saucy Seawitch says lobster fishermen in Nova Scotia threatened to throw the previous fisheries minister off the wharf uh, after they had their way with her. It was vile. 
Uh, and then the conservatives were mad that she was refusing to meet with them. Um, I, I just wanted to, you know, Kimberly says communication costs money. Municipalities don't have communication departments. Uh, not necessarily true. Um, I, I mean, it does cost money. You're right. But I mean, they should have communication departments. Maybe some of the smaller ones don't, but certainly the bigger cities definitely do. <laughs> Justin of Balgoni is in the chat, says the show's only purpose is to drive division between people. Real talk my ass. That is one of the funniest comments I've ever heard in my life. Um, you can send us emails anytime uh, to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Uh, in particular, the fiery ones, especially if they're entertaining, we reserve for our hottest five minutes of the week, and that's the Flamethrower. Every Friday, presented by the DQs of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park, we have some doozies this week, and we'll be getting into those coming up on Friday. Again, just put the Flamethrower into the subject line of the email, and uh, we'll get to as many as we can. We pick the best ones, all of them real emails to talk at ryanjesperson.com. We're going to get to more stories of the day. I want to talk about the relationship between the, the province and municipalities, municipalities and the feds, because Alberta says it's 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 butting in. Alberta says no more deals between Ottawa and municipalities, despite the fact that the FCM, I won't get too nerdy here, but you remember the Federation of Canadian Municipalities is a big national organization. That's what they're asking for. They've been asking for more cooperation, more direct collaboration between Ottawa and municipalities on custom solutions and well-funded solutions to some of the real problems, in particular housing. And we've seen that. The Prime Minister was splashing hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars around Western Canada near the end of February when he came to talk to us. Remember, he sat in our studio just like a half an hour, an hour before making a big announcement right in Edmonton. Well, that raised the ire of Alberta Premier Daniel Smith, who says no more of that. We'll take a look at that story coming up in just a little bit. But first, I have to put April 12th on your radar. If you live anywhere near us, if you're within like 90 minutes of the city of Edmonton, Metro Edmonton, we want to let you know that Friesen Brothers on April 12th is opening the doors to its 17th location this one they've raised the bar even higher it's Friesen Brothers Fresh Market Glenora in West Edmonton a brand new shopping experience for all their customers dedicated to quality and craft with real butchers real sourdough bakers and red seal chefs it is truly a one-of-a-kind shopping destination with unique offerings in every department I've toured the store already it will blow your freaking mind uh, if you're into meats that butcher shop is unlike anything else I've ever seen in a grocery store. You're, you're going to see what I mean when you visit. It all opens coming up April 12th. Amazing. Last night we went to Freezing Bros. We were talking about having soup and sandwich. And my wife goes, what What? What do we use? Like, what's the best if we're going to make a panini? Oh, Because we're going to have a panini. I said we should panini it. What's the best bread to use? And I said, well, it's got to be something soft, you know. But maybe, like, people think of focaccia or ciabatta or whatever we went and got the sourdough this stuff is so good oh, to put buddy. in a panini press because it's so soft you put a little butter on each side you put we put a we put some uh, faux turkey in there some cheese some lettuce some onions spinach tomatoes had it with Dude. the soup absolutely incredible oh. there's no better sourdough in the city then right there at Freezing Bros. Go Look grab at it. that. And your, your panini game is on point. <laughs> we don't go too hard. Somebody said the cheese isn't melted. We like to just have, like when we're having a sandwich, just toast it a bit. But okay. just get it all in there. I but. think there could be different schools of thought on the, of the degree to which you panini. Some people like seal it Can all in. Can panini be a it's verb? It's up to you. I think we're gonna, <laughs> what are we doing tonight? We're going to panini with the ciabatta and the sour. Okay, I'm going to oh, knock okay, that that's... off. That, that's, <laughs> nobody needs to hear that. Our friends at Eden Landscaping are set to go shovel in the ground. I mean, over the next number of weeks, their teams are going to be hard at work turning these 3D renderings, these visions for outdoor spaces into real life. And nobody does it better than them in central and northern Alberta, a custom landscape builder with more than 20 years of on the ground experience. Once these blooms start coming in, once our Japanese lilacs start really showing off, I'm going to show you photos and videos from our own backyard. Eden Landscaping worked on that project for us. Came in just a little bit under budget, by the way, last summer. They can do the same for you. It all starts with a conversation where you can learn more about their design philosophy and, uh, well, basically get the ball rolling. It all starts with Eden Landscaping's website. That's landscapeedmonton.ca. 
We're talking a lot about Alberta energy. We're talking a lot about climate change. Pathways Alliance, you've heard of the organization. Randy Boissonneau, Liberal Minister, talking about it last time he was on the show. It's uh, working, Pathways Alliance is, with governments on a proposed carbon capture and storage network for Canada's oil sands. Uh, We all know that global energy demands are changing, and that's why Canada's six largest oil sands companies are working together to offer the world responsibly produced oil. They're working with governments, both levels, Pathways Alliance planning to build a large-scale carbon capture and storage network that will reduce emissions from operations while protecting existing jobs and creating new ones. You can learn more by visiting pathwaysalliance.ca. And uh, Johnny, I got something coming up uh, this weekend, and I wanted to talk to you guys about it just really quickly before we move on. Uh, Andy Polanski uh, was an absolutely beloved young man. Uh, the uh, Obviously, the story of, of Andy, um, a beloved member of his community, known for his infectious laugh, selfless nature. Uh, his life was cut short in a motor vehicle accident. Uh, but even in death, Andy continues to give Uh, He became an organ and tissue donor about 11 years ago when this tragedy struck and saved and changed the lives of five people in the Edmonton area. And that's why the Andy Polanski Charitable Foundation exists uh, to ensure that they can create uh, support and maintain that support for organ donor families. Uh, Coming up on April 20th, I am so honored and proud to be working with the Andy Polanski Charitable Foundation. This is like a room full of people who just love this guy and honor his memory for an evening of hope. It's a gala fundraiser at the beautiful Fort Saskatchewan Community Hall. Uh, Saturday, April 20th, doors open at 6.30. All funds raised uh, will go to support organ donor families in Canada. We're also going to experience the energy of the long run. It's Canada's salute to the Eagles featuring all their top hits. I'm running the live auction, Johnny. You should see the auction items they've lined up. going to be absolutely amazing. You can get your tickets. Real Talkers, I would love to see you out there in support of a wonderful cause. Just check out APCF. That's the Andy Polanski Charitable Foundation, apcf.ca to get your tickets. Um, I'm going to put that link in the show notes. And if you are out there with us in Fort Saskatchewan the evening of April 20th, you come up, give me the code word. What's your code word be? Real talk? Real talk RJ? You come up to me, you say real talk RJ, I'm buying you a beer. Put it that way. At the Andy Polanski Charitable Foundation Evening of Hope Gala coming up on April 20th. I appreciate those reminders, you know, things like organ mm-hmm. donation where, where you understand yeah. a, fr- a friend of mine, uh, Peter Coppice, uh, just love that guy passed away uh, re- really uh, uh, early in life, unfortunately, 26 years of age. Uh, but he was an organ donor. He'd signed his card, uh, mm-hmm. lived in Seattle at the time. And, and we, we were able to learn after the fact. I mean, nothing eases the pain of, of loss like that when a young person uh, dies, you know, obviously well before their time, uh, or at least that's the way you feel about it. Um, but to understand in Peter's case, uh, you know, seven different families, everything from like retinas to the heart, to the lungs, um, an unbelievable opportunity to, to continue a legacy, to help other families, um, following your own passing. And, and maybe this is the reminder, maybe this is a sign in the show, uh, to sign that organ donor card or the next time that you renew your driver's license to make sure you let them know that you want to be an organ donor. That's something we did last mm-hmm. time my renewal came up just to make sure that that box was ticked. Yeah, of course. You know, it's something that you can do to you know mm-hmm. make a big difference, right? I, I, hopefully I can tick some boxes like don't take these organs because they're not going to be good, but take these other ones. They'll, they'll, they'll do the investigation <laughs> to save people yeah, the trouble, right, like, you know, to save people the trouble. Do not take the liver. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I, I, I feel like I'm going to call an audible right now. We weren't okay. going to do this, but um, we we're talking about organ donation. Um, I'm going to do this. Uh, so this is, you're not expecting this, but just work with me. Okay. And, and, and we'll just run this. I like, we can do this on this show. Sure. Um, we got an email f- uh, a while ago from uh, Leslie, a real talker by the name of Leslie. And she wrote in first in February. And uh, I, I had corresponded with Leslie and we were planning on doing something with this. Um, she said, I was talking to you about a friend of mine. I'm not going to use her name, but a friend of mine is, is uh, fighting for her life right now. And we're so very proud of her um, uh, in stage four uh, cancer. And, and I had shared 
shared. Um, I don't know if you remember this. It was kind of like just a comment I made on the show. We were talking about politics and we were talking about, um, you know, healthcare funding and the bickering that we mm-hmm. see from politicians and the, the, you know, mismanagement or bloated kind of middle management that we see, the criticism we see in healthcare delivery across the country. And, and, I, and, I, and I briefly expressed my real frustration that it had taken my dear friend months months to get in to see an oncologist mm-hmm. uh, w- w- when her diagnosis was first happening. And uh, obviously that, that stands in the way or that hampers um, the, the, the immediate fight. You want to throw everything that you can at cancer when it's first detected, right? Well, 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 my expression of my frustration and the pain that we're feeling had resonated with Leslie. And so Leslie wrote in to say, Jespo, it really resonated when you mentioned your good friend's battle with stage four cancer, your frustration with how slow the healthcare system is right now. And uh, she said, I want you to know how sorry I am that, that you and of course your friend are dealing with this. You could hear in your voice the deep concern, the care that you have, and I can relate to it, says Leslie, one of my loved ones going through quite an uncertain time as well regarding health. Uh, said the main inspiration for this letter two of my very close Alberta family members loved ones are particularly feeling the effects of the United Conservative government right now not in a good way Um, our son uh, S and his fiance K so this is how she wrote her first email to us K just first initials Um, she said after a very long road I won't go into details our fabulous future son-in-law much to our relief has finally made it onto the donor list Um, not only to receive a heart transplant, but also a liver transplant. At just 32 years of age, he needs two vital organs replaced. Uh, Leslie says, let that sink in, Uh, two of them, and he needs it done soon. Uh, She says, I I can't tell you enough about Kay, who is facing this life-altering event. He's a beloved high school teacher in Alberta. He is an incredible joy. He is every parent's dream son-in-law come true. And our own son, S, uh, who is so dedicated alongside K advocating for him here. Uh, we are so very proud of these two brave young men as they face this together. You know, something positive, I guess, is that they're the transplant doctors and the team that they're working with have been phenomenal. And we're very lucky that he has that now on top of everything else. We're trying to stay happy and positive. But in the past year, we've all seen and felt very deeply the damage that the premier, that take back Alberta and that this government has done to Alberta, a crumbling healthcare system that doctors are leaving and a vital donor program that Alberta is partially leaving because there's not enough health care workers not to mention the full-on hate campaign that, that the premier seems to be waging on teachers health care workers and, and even now it feels like the lgbtq community it feels like so many albertans are, are suffering because of the choices this government's making you know it says our son our future son-in-law in an attempt to keep things light have joked that maybe they'll have to move out of alberta in order to survive you know k has told told us that he feels like the premier might have something personal against him And so you see that everything that happens south of the border in Alberta right now seems to affect my family, my friends, even though I'm not living in Alberta. I'm a regular and engaged listener of Real Talk. I really appreciate that you welcome listeners from across the country. She says, and I appreciate the opportunity to blow off steam with an email to the show. She says, I got permission from S and K to send this into Real Talk, just so you know. And so I had replied to Leslie and just let her know it was on our radar. I appreciated her her sympathy for our situation and, and, and I wished her well in their situation. So we get a follow-up email from her mm-hmm. mid-March. And she says, um, I wrote you about my son, and now we find out S and K. She says, I wrote you about my son Spencer and his fiance Kevin needing a double transplant and says, I wanted to give you an update. Okay, so this email comes five weeks later she says i've not had the chance to listen to real talk for the past week as on march 4th kevin got the call to come to the university hospital in edmonton because a new heart and liver had become available for him uh and he received his new heart and liver that same day leslie says i won't go into the agonizing details of the roller coaster of emotions and the many heroic efforts that the doctors and nurses took over the past week to keep Kevin alive during his surgery and throughout the week. Ultimately, his new heart was working and looking good, but his new liver just couldn't adjust. And Kevin passed on the 12th of March at 5.07 p.m. And he will be so missed by us, his family, his many, many friends, and his drama students at Burt Church High School in Airdrie. 
My son Spencer will have to create an entire new life without Kevin, and he's absolutely devastated. And we are so proud of him uh, for over the last week conducting himself in such an awe-inspiring, selfless way, showing care and compassion to Kevin's family and friends while he himself is enduring these traumatic events. Spencer has already expressed because of this that he wants to be an advocate for better health care in this province, and this will guide his career in social work and possibly working in the area of transplants. Doctors and nurses really are superstars and they deserve so much better than how they're being treated right now. We are forever grateful to the army of healthcare workers who are so passionate and dedicated to helping all of us stay healthy. And we are forever grateful for their efforts this past week. She writes this mid-March at the Mazankowski Alberta Health or the Alberta Heart Institute. She says, I wanted to provide an update and perhaps some sort of closure for them. Thank you for the Real Talk community. It really is a super platform. You and Johnny are doing great work. I love the audience, and I look forward to catching up and listening again. That from Leslie. Wow. Hey. That's a great email. You know, I mean, sad, but... It's so sad. Um, Great connection. And you think of this young man who, uh, you know, obviously he and his loved ones... His family did everything they could. Mm -hmm. Doctors did everything they could. He had a fighting chance because somebody signed their donor card. Mm -hmm. Somebody was able to to donate those organs posthumously. Um, But it's just a reminder to me, and and, and that, that, that email has been sitting on this table. There's a stack of emails that we have on this table, and, and uh, th- these are like the real top shelf ones, and we really try every show to, to, to at least get one of your messages read because so many of you uh, use this platform and this community as a way to communicate with others, with your fellow Albertans, with your fellow Canadians. And so when I'm talking about Andy Polanski and the Evening of Hope and organ donation, mm-hmm. I'm sitting there going, I've, I've been hanging on to this email from Leslie, these two emails five weeks apart just waiting for that right moment and the moment struck today, um, there is always, it is never lost on me, no matter what we're talking about, there is someone in this audience with whom the issue resonates directly. Oh, it's affecting everyone now. I, th- I think like every few months now, my partner Jatinder is relaying to me a message from someone who is dealing with or knows someone in their circle of family or friends or, or someone who's dealing with cancer. I mean, the rates on the rise right now, I was looking at the stats just this morning, one in 24 Canadians has been diagnosed at least one one form of cancer in the last 25 years. Wow. But if there's any kind of silver lining, it's, it's from people who, you know, do organ donation research and development into cancer. The number of people living with or beyond cancer in Canada. So survival rates also increasing with the number of cases. So Mm. it's a little bit of a silver lining, but we were talking about this the other day, how, you know, it's, almost impossible i mean other than you know people who who don't live healthy lives and smoke and stuff like that to see why this is happening is it everything is it because our cell phones are on our heads all day is it because you know food isn't being grown the way it should like it used to be is it because of the soil it's just a number of factors right it's just yeah. a ton of things that are making this affect everybody you know and would you look at this it just so happens that leslie um is in the chat right now and um so she leaves a message says thank you ryan i'm in tears as you read this so much appreciated i'll share this with my son please do leslie we love you we love him um and we sure appreciate you being a member of this community and and i'm going to leave this to our live chat right now to show leslie some love they're already doing it they don't need our instruction on that um this is amazing you guys and uh, i appreciate all of you um Hey, listen, well, we're talking about Kevin and Spencer, um, and uh, though they were never able to to ultimately uh, celebrate their wedding, um, maybe in honor of them, on the fly, why don't we dedicate this uh, episode of mm-hmm. My Jasper Memories to them? Um, we're talking about Jasper Pride, and this is a shout-out to the LGBTQ2S plus community across the country. Uh, you know the Jasper Pride and Ski Festival is coming up. It's, it's honestly... Probably, I would say, one of the highest profile pride celebrations across the country. They do it so well. April 12th through the 21st, it's the only gay ski week in the Canadian Rockies. And we've talked to you about it before, but we wanted to give you a bit of a different angle this week and celebrate Jasper businesses that are setting the standard for uh, 2S LGBTQI plus friendly practices. Rainbow Registered is a Canadian nonprofit that represents a coalition 
of LGBTQ-owned and supported businesses. So they set out to create a nationally accredited program across the country, and several Jasper institutions have graduated. Most recently, we want to give a shout out to our friends at Evil Dave's Grill. They were the very first restaurant in the entire province of Alberta to become Rainbow Registered. How cool is that? Uh, Metro Pharmacy was the very first pharmacy in the country to become Rainbow Registered. Tourism Jasper, our good friends there, the very first destination marketing organization in the entire province of Alberta to become Rainbow Registered. This is just more evidence that Jasper is a wonderful way to celebrate pride. And the Jasper Pride Festival, Alberta's third largest kicks off this weekend we want to invite you to join everybody out there for 10 days of incredible adventure during the only gay ski week in the rockies you can see the event lineup and check out their colorful programming by visiting jasperpride.ca when you're out at pride in jasper if you're posting on instagram or twitter make sure you hashtag my jasper and real talk rj we'd love to show your photos or video in a future episode of my jasper memories presented by our friends at tourism jasper Daniel Smith wants to fight the feds. Oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah, just a change of pace. What else is now? Just a change of pace. <laughs> uh, but our buddy Rick Bell, um, so I saw somebody in the chat earlier saying something like Jespo was going easier. Jespo was being generous on Rick Bell. I think Rick Bell is hilarious. Hi, Rick, I'm Jespo. <laughs> let me tell you I, something. I, he's, 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 and, 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 well, I've microphone been, I, wasn't working. I've, I've been sending Rick messages. I'm like, dude. I love when, it. I'm like, when? He, <laughs> I'll say this to his face. He is the most frustrating guy to deal with trying to book interviews because you're always like, I'll, 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 I'll float him a note and I'll say like, <laughs> Hey, Rick, what's your week looking like? And he'll write back, don't know. And I'm like, can you let me know when you know? Because we want to get him on. Because every time he comes on here, he's absolutely hilarious. Uh, Much like our guest yesterday, Jen Gerson, uh, Rick Bell really doesn't give a shit what anybody thinks about his writing. Uh, He gets the scoops and he throws his hot takes out there. And uh, he's got a very unique writing style. Uh, He talks about this scribe and your man, and he kind of transcribes his interviews, and it's it's all very entertaining. But he's got an exclusive with Alberta's Premier. It's just out uh, the day we're talking about it, today on April 10th. Daniel Smith reads the headline, punches back against Justin Trudeau again. You can read it in in The Sun or the Calgary Herald. And, And Bell basically goes on and talks about his conversation with Daniel Smith, who tells him she is not going to tolerate the Prime Minister Justin Trudeau sticking his nose into the province's business. She does not like that the feds are making side deals, as she characterizes them, with cities or other local governments or Alberta public sector organizations. She wants it to all go through the province. And so Daniel Smith tells Rick Bell, basically telling Albertans that there's going to be a law. They're going to they're going to implement a law. They're going to they're going to draft a legislation saying that there will be no deals whatsoever between the feds and the groups I just mentioned, including big cities. Uh, without a thumbs up from Alberta, without a thumbs up from the province. And she says, basically, without the green light, the the agreements won't be worth the paper they're written on. Says Danielle Smith of the prime minister, he's the one who punches us in the nose. And, uh, you know, we punch back and we're going to keep punching back until he realizes he's going to treat us in a different way. Uh, So she says she wants the feds to respect and work with the province as they do with Quebec. The premier says we just want to be treated the same as Quebec. And she says, uh, then, if it doesn't work out, we're going to go to court. And, of course, everybody loves a court battle. Uh, Everybody loves a court battle because it's great for politics. Mm -hmm. It's great for headlines. Uh, Quite frankly, it's great for talk shows. You know what it's not great for is the bottom line. Yeah. uh, Because they're very expensive. Uh, You know, we're going to keep the government's lawyers, the proxy lawyers, well-employed. I'm sure it's great for them. I don't know if it's great for the average person. When we're talking about taxes, when we're talking about bottom lines, when we're talking about where we're spending our money, uh, here's a good example. Premier says they're using federal spending power for political purposes, which is probably true, in violation of the spirit of the Constitution. She says it's blatantly political, she says, as she rattles her saber and threatens to sue the feds. Uh, They're the ones. Everybody's political. Everything is political. Can we all agree? She says there's always an angle, this government. They're picking favorites. They're picking winners and losers. They're implementing programs unfairly. Sound familiar? Sound familiar, anybody? Governments picking favorites, winners and losers. The most recent provincial budget, Calgary getting $300 million for an arena, Edmonton getting dick all. Does that sound familiar? Winners and losers, some people getting money, others not. 
But here's where it gets interesting is Daniel Smith says that the federal dollars that the prime minister is waving around, and this comes back to kind of the spirit of the equalization conversation mm-hmm. and everything else. The lion's share of them, says the premier, comes from Alberta, the federal dollars he's waving around, and he's not even distributing them back fairly. So she is deftly and skillfully steering this conversation back to Alberta's not getting as much as it's putting in. And you know that's going to play well in the province of Alberta. So this is a story we're going to keep an eye on because it could get really interesting. I don't think, and we'll see how this law plays out. Alberta government's got to make it happen first, and they'll do that, I would imagine, in short order. The minute they talk about something like this, you know that they got a plan to implement it. But what does it actually mean? Will it stand up to court scrutiny? And, and perhaps uh, more significantly, what are the feds going to do about it? Because Justin Trudeau has got about a year approximately a year, maybe a year and a half at most to figure out what he's going to do to try to pull his plane out of this nosedive, right? He's got to figure out how he's going to try to save his own political career. Uh, If you ask me, it's too little too late, but you don't, you know, you got the sense when he talked to us, he's not going anywhere. He says he's not going anywhere. He basically told us that he's running in the next election. And so if he doesn't want to own a huge loss, he's got to figure out a way to maintain support in areas they have it and try to grow it elsewhere, which, which, you know, really is a Herculean task. And ultimately, what does this mean for the municipalities? The municipalities that have not been able to get deals done with the province, so they are working with the feds because they desperately need hundreds of millions of dollars worth of infrastructure improvements and housing. And the municipalities don't have the time nor the luxury to watch court cases play out or wait for the next election cycle, right? They've got to figure something out right now this all comes back all the stories that we talk about they seem to come back to a hub there seems to be kind of common themes that tie all these stories together it's not lost on us and we'll continue to follow these stories if this is something that's resonating with you and you've got a hot take on it we'd love to hear from you to talk at ryanjesperson.com do you support the Alberta government, do you support Premier Smith's take on this? Do you think that the deals between the feds and municipalities should run through the province? Or is it time that the province butt out? I mean, Daniel Smith, the spirit of her governance, the spirit of her comments, even as a talk radio host, was that certain governments need to understand when to butt out, when to stay in their lane, right? But they're not staying in their lane on this one. I understand why. We've just kind of laid out the general strategy behind it, the general thinking. They're not staying in their I mean, the intervener status in Saskatchewan and the court challenge there with the parents and the pronouns. Alberta inserting itself into that one. That's not really staying in your lane, is it? Let us know what you think. In just a second, I want to get to a couple of emails, uh, more of these uh, from Colin and Jared. And Jared follows up. I'm going to get you to to bring up that short, Johnny, on Augie. Remember that one that that we ran back in December? Do you remember that? That was so beautiful. Well, Jared wrote in about his dog, Augie, but he followed up, and and we had to get to this. It kind of like, to be honest, it it, 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 it made a real impact on me yesterday. (laughs) You saw it. You were like, are you okay? I was like, I'm great, man. I said, and I didn't read you the email. I said, I'm going to save it for the show because Mm -hmm. it's it's just a, a really interesting take from a real talker Um, but first i wanted to let those of you know that have working been working either as electricians or maybe you're an apprentice you're looking to get your career started or you're looking to join a company that's growing as opposed to stagnant as opposed to not appreciating your efforts kubi renewable energy is hiring right now check out the careers link at kubienergy.ca as they grow clean energy in canada you know they're canada's fastest growing solar installer and a lot of people are going to kubi because they like the way they roll they like the vibe they like like the way that they treat their employees, everything from their Christmas parties to their staff incentives to the fact that they have a floor hockey area in their warehouse. They have a beer tap in the break room for after hours, obviously. Kubi Energy does it different than anybody else, and that's probably why some of Canada's most skilled tradespeople are taking their talents to Kubi Energy. They're also hiring in HR, sales, office management, you name it. You can check out the opportunities for Kamloops, Lethbridge, Calgary, and Edmonton by visiting kubienergy.ca. If you're going, yeah, okay, that sounds pretty good, but before I get to Kubi or before I start my career, I need to get certified. I need to get educated. I need to level up my understanding of the world around me. That's where Athabasca University comes into the mix. Canada's open university offers world-class accredited online degrees and courses. They design them so you can complete your education wherever and whenever it works for you. You can check out the programs and courses at AthabascaU.ca. They've got open undergrad programs. They've got diplomas, certificates, degrees, flexible graduate 
private programs, including an MBA program that I think we need to talk more about. Plus, on-demand and professional development opportunities. You'll find it all at AthabascaU.ca. Learn more about the AU Advantage at Athabasca University. And as we're talking about this season, you were talking about floods and fires and all the stuff that seems to come with the advent of spring into summer, especially this year with such little precipitation. Our friends at Complete Care Restoration know that they're going to be busy. And I say this all the time because when they said it to me, it kind of hit me like a ton of bricks. They said, we are probably your only sponsor that hopes that none of your audience members ever have to call us. But listen, if your basement does flood, if a, if a sewer backup happens, oh, it's just the worst, right? If a pipe bursts, if there's a fire, regardless of context, Complete Care Restoration has more than 25 years of experience restoring properties, rebuilding peace of mind. You can contact them today at Complete Care Restoration. Ca. And before we get to these emails about dogs, I wanted to remind, hey, I think that there's maybe a segue here, John. Have you ever had all of your dog's treats and food and water dishes and bowls and leashes and harnesses just kind of hanging around the house making a mess? Imagine if sure. you had a beautifully designed and constructed mud room or Ooh. boot room. Uh, there you go. Where you're going with this. Done and designed and built out by California Closets. Uh, we would love a custom mudroom. That might be next on our list, to be honest with you. In past, we had them work on our uh, walk-in closet for Carrie. They did a beautiful job. They got a freaking chandelier in there. I absolutely love what they did with our entertainment center in our home. And then, of course, small little improvements elsewhere. They worked with our budget, and they can work with yours. As a matter of fact, I would go so far as to guarantee you will be thrilled with your free consultation if it moves forward into a full-blown project. Man, oh man, the proof is in the pudding. Nobody does it better than California Closets. It all starts with that free consultation to californiaclosets.ca. We've been talking a lot about dogs uh, this week. Um, and as we open the show today, talking about uh, Cash Gris, that 11-year-old boy who lost his life. Uh, obviously, the story has been resonating with our audience members because you have continued to email us. You have continued to comment on the videos that we've been putting out. And so we want to make sure that we leave some time, as long as these emails are coming in, to read what you have to say to us. Uh, Charles Adler and I took this on uh, the first episode this week. And, and Chuck basically, I think, raised a few eyebrows. Um, Chuck's a dog guy. I'm a dog guy. Johnny He's a dog guy. Obviously, a lot of, of, of dog companions. I'm trying not to say owners, but dog companions in our listening audience. That's obvious. And Adler kind of had a moment that I didn't necessarily expect where he said these two cane corsos, these two big dogs uh, involved in this attack, the ones that killed this this little guy. Um, Adler said he, he he had basically felt like they didn't need to be euthanized. Mm -hmm. um, he, had, he, had, he had sort of found himself hoping for like a sanctuary type situation or an alternative outcome there. Um, and, and it really lit a fire under a bunch of you, uh, including Colin, who wrote in and said, Jesper, I just absolutely love Real Talk, continues to be one of the highlights of my day. Thank you, Colin. He says, I've learned so much from the varied issues and viewpoints, and please keep it up. Colin, we promise we will. He says, I write because of the immense frustration I felt listening to your episode this week on that tragic fatal dog attack, and in particular, the hot air that was spewing from Charles Adler. Colin says, I get it. A lot of people own dogs and they love them dearly. One of my favorite episodes of yours was on grief uh, with your expert. You know, oh, man. Remember that, Jeremy, that, that joined mm -hmm. us? Um, a grief counselor at, uh, I think it's deathed.ca, isn't that? Uh, that's his business, I believe. Um, I'll, I'll correct that. It, there it is. Uh, it, Jeremy talked to us. I'll never forget that episode. As a matter of fact, we'll link to it in the show notes. Um, but, but, we had J Jeremy Allen scheduled to join us on the show. And then the night before the interview, do you remember this? His dog passed away. Yeah. And uh, he had reached out to us and basically let us know what was going on, but did not want to cancel the interview. And so I, I went, okay. And it ended up being one of the most raw and real conversations that we've ever done uh, with Jeremy Allen. So he's talking about grief, big picture, but he was also grieving. And, uh, and, and Colin, I'm not surprised that that episode resonated with you. Me as well. Um, he said, your expert who shared his pain after his dog had recently passed. Dogs are special and they give us so much. Colin says, we cherish our own small dog. 
Uh, but that does not, however, justify all the clutching of pearls, the cognitive dissonance, and the mental gymnastics that dog owners pretend to go through to, to pretend or act or justify this as a complicated issue. He says this is a simple issue. We had asked you by way of an unofficial unscientific Twitter poll, about 4,000 of you responded, you know, what should happen in this specific circumstance and circumstances like this when a dog kills someone or when a dog attacks someone and hurts them badly or when a dog kills another dog. Uh, and about two thirds of you said that the dog should be euthanized and the owner should be charged. About two thirds of, of you in this unofficial Twitter poll. And so Colin says like certain dogs are dangerous and dog owners are responsible for their dog. Anything short of that is absolute nonsense. Uh, if not the owner, then sorry, who's responsible? I was shocked when Adler spouted off that he doesn't believe that these two killing machines should be euthanized. How sad that was. I'm thankful that the handlers and the animal service workers were not killed or maimed by these beasts. And I'm thankful that society and the system was able to take care of these animals and did not struggle with the emotional nonsense that Adler's clearly struggling with. I mean, what kind of bleeding heart garbage is this? How about he take him on and rehabilitate them as he espoused and let his grandkids play with them? You know, this from a man who was so proud to claim that the Humboldt driver should be shipped out on the next plane to India. Fair point. Colin says, I guess we can all continue the charade and act so surprised that a small number of breeds kill and maim more people than should ever happen. These dogs have been bred to be muscular, to hunt, to protect, to intimidate, to fight, and to hurt other things. And we act surprised when another pit bull or mastiff or Rottweiler or cane corso kills or maims another kid or another adult. Imagine the stats on how many near-death incidents have occurred from these same breeds that never make it to the newspapers. How many dogs were killed or maimed at dog parks that were never reported? These big, potentially lethal breeds should be outlawed, says Colin. It's not complicated. It's not your right to own a pit bull to scare the shit out of your friends because you have a small penis and need to feel like a big man. That's going to prompt some emails. He says it's about as surprising that a drunk driver might kill somebody, that a loaded gun in your bedroom might kill somebody, that starting a fire with gasoline might kill somebody. There are no surprises here. This is as predictable as the sun rising every day. And if you think that kids should never be left alone with a dog, then get rid of your fucking dog. Colin says, I get it. People love dogs. So get a dog that doesn't have the ability to kill your neighbor when it's having a bad day. And if it does decide to follow its instinct and kill someone or maim them, be prepared to spend a significant part of your life in prison or paying compensation after your dog is put down. That from Colin. I think that could have been a flamethrower. It should have been. This one here from Jared, uh, and, and this one really stuck with me because Jared wrote in quite some time ago. He wrote in in December about his dog, Augie. And Augie had just passed away. And it was a heart-wrenching email. It resonated with a lot of you. As a matter of fact, we released it as a highlight. We released it as a short. We released it on Instagram. We released it on Twitter. You get the idea. Johnny, can we tee this up? This was a portion of the December email about five months ago from Jared. I understand if you can't read this on air, as I know it will hit close to home. I finished crying enough to begin writing. He says, I lost my second dog, Augie, very suddenly tonight. Augie was eight and a half years old a beautiful roddy shepherd mix he had a six and a half centimeter tumor on his spleen life comes at you fast especially in dog years you never know what's around the next bend give those you love a hug tell them you love them spend time with them foster those relationships i was blessed to have the time and the space to make sure that everybody could say goodbye to augie but this can play out differently with people that we care about you can't insulate yourself from it nor can you insulate your kids uh, what i do know is i can show them how to grieve healthily. It's okay for dad to cry. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to learn how to pick up the pieces and move on while honoring their memory and the memory of what you've lost. One day your kids will face grief again and they'll need to know how to grieve. I'm staying home with my kids tomorrow morning and I will play and love and grieve and laugh and cry. So that was a portion of Jared's email in December. Um, just amazing. And he follows up with us this week. And he says, Jespo, I shared Augie's story with uh, Real Talk in December when he passed, uh, but I didn't share the full story of Lilu, my first dog. And he had sent us photos of the two of them together. He said, but it feels more pertinent now as you've been talking to Adler and Johnny and Real Talkers have been writing in about the tragedy of this 11-year-old boy. 
Cash that was killed by a dog by dogs this month. It's a devastating story. Nothing will bring that boy back. Nothing will fill the hole in his parents' hearts or allow that dog owner to rewind time to do better and to avert the tragedy. And I don't want to speculate about details, but I do want to share Lilu's story. It's one of redemption and ruination. And it doesn't remotely compare to what happened on April 1st, but it reminds me that people and dogs are individuals with life stories and that life is messy. Jared says Lilu was a purebred boxer from a puppy mill. Uh, after her first litter of puppies resulted in a C-section, uh, Johnny, I shot you some photos of Lilu. They're in the Slack if you want to throw them up there. Mm-hmm. Um, after her first litter of puppies resulted in a C-section, she was no longer a moneymaker. And so the puppy mill owners gave Lilu to relatives where she promptly destroyed their living room. Uh, From there, she went on to the Edmonton Humane Society and bounced through two or three more attempts at adoption, every time destroying living rooms because the adopters left her with free reign of the house instead of crate training her. Uh, You can't tell from the photos that I sent you, but Lilu showed obvious signs of a rough upbringing. Uh, The tip of uh, an ear was missing. She had bite scars on her legs. I don't know any more than that, but I suspect the puppy mill was not a particularly kind place. And so when my wife and I finally adopted her from the Humane Society, she came with some pretty strict instructions. Crate training would be required, and she was to only go home to people with no pets and no kids. Uh, My wife and I fit that bill, and with a living room full of sort of like Goodwill-type furniture, uh, living room destruction wasn't a huge concern of ours, so we diligently crate-trained beautiful Lilu. And eventually, over many months and one big leap of faith, she was free of the crate without destroying any furniture in our house. Lilu was redeemed. I won't bore your listeners with like the full life story, but at this point you can insert all the happy dog memories that you might think of, you know, introducing Augie, another puppy into the family, watching that mothering instinct appear in Lilu, long walks at the dog park, watching Lilu take care of your first kid. Jared says, you're right, Jespo, boxers are great with kids. Everything was wonderful until all of a sudden it wasn't. I was sitting in the living room with my two-year-old daughter in my lap, and we were talking about Lilu, who was lying on the floor in front of us. We were saying feet and petting her feet and tail and petting her tail, and then we said face. And my beautiful daughter and I touched Lilu's cheek, and Lilu snapped and bit my daughter's face. Now, thankfully, it only resulted in a scratch, and the visit to the doctor uh, resulted in just a small Band-Aid, but trust was broken. Lilu had resorted to her animal instincts and bit my child. Why? Well, she was getting older. Her hips were giving her trouble. Unbeknownst to me until later that night, she had a cyst on her cheek that was probably causing a lot of discomfort. We touched her cheeks, and because she was unable to get up quickly, unable to get away due to slippery laminate flooring in her bad hips, she resorted to the last tool in her toolbox, which was biting. After a long and emotionally difficult evening, my wife and I made the decision to put Lilu down. She was nearing her life expectancy. She needed some dental work. She had a newly discovered cyst on her face, bad hips, and a rough history with the adoption system, and and she had just bit our daughter. And after a long one-week wait with a dog we didn't trust around our toddler anymore, uh, I didn't know this, by the way, Johnny says you can't euthanize a dog that's bit a person for one week in case they need samples from the dog. I didn't know that. Says my wife and I went to the vet to put Lilu down. He says, I I sent you a photo of Lilu attached taken shortly before the appointment. He says, now, I'm sure people will have all kinds of opinions about this. You know, you should have gotten rid of Lilu when you had kids. You shouldn't have put Lilu down. You should have rehomed her. Jared says, that's fine. I don't second guess my choice. I don't second guess the decision to keep Lilu away from our daughter. Uh, But from time to time, I do question if putting her down was the right call. How could I not? He says, I'm incredibly lucky that my daughter was not injured more badly. I'm incredibly lucky that Lilu was a boxer with a stubby mouth, not good at biting faces, and that I was there to intervene immediately. Imagine if my daughter had been with Lilu in a different part of the house by herself. I'm simply left with a story of redemption and ruination and nothing more. And my heart goes out to the family grieving the death of their son. My heart goes out to the police officers who tried to save that little boy and to our justice system as they try to apply justice and restitution to a situation that cannot be undone. He says, I'm going to end with a quote from this boy's father, from Cash's father, that has really stuck with me the past two days. He says, I get there's a lot of factors at play here, including past history with these dogs, but damn, can I ever identify with this quote? And that is, he, my son, was around these dogs that everybody's labeling as monsters. I watched these dogs cuddle with him almost every day. Jared signs off one love. Thank you for that. 
appreciate the firsthand perspective from so many of you. Now, I see some of you in our live chat today are talking about how we're talking a lot about the dogs. We're talking a lot about the dad. We're talking a lot about the owner. And we're not talking about how Cash Grist died. Uh, and that is because I cannot talk about it. We've tried to articulate it. I can't stop thinking about it. One of the most horrific possible ways to go. It's gut wrenching. It is heart shattering. It is impossible to walk an inch in the shoes of his mom, his grandma, his dad, anybody that knew him, his classmates, to know that he suffered, to know that they, the police officers and NEMTs tried to apply life-saving measures unsuccessfully that he was declared dead on scene. So we're not talking about how he died because it's implied and it's heartbreaking and I can't think about it too much or it just absolutely crushes me. But in memory of this little boy, we'll continue to focus on this. We'll continue to talk about this story as long as real talkers need to talk about it. And we will remind you, of course, as well, that there are families that navigate these types of things all the time. Unfortunately, tragedy that we can't imagine. And the one thing that we can do is to gather here in community and talk about it and work to impact change in our communities as we see fit to get involved. I saw somebody earlier today when we were talking to the mayor to Sue McCordoff out of Asuyus saying democracy is a thing that you do. So is community service. So is community period. And nobody does it better than you real talkers. We appreciate you. Wanted to remind you, coming up on Friday, it's our weekly Real Talk Roundtable. As we wrap here today, wanted to let you know that we're going to make good on our promise to give you that scoop. There's a new conservative party in Canada, a federal one. You can't sign up quite yet. But we're going to find out ways you can get involved. What's their justification? Why are they doing it? And can they possibly win a seat in the next federal election? We'll get into it. That's coming up on Friday, April 12th, right here on Real Talk. One love. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson, executive producer.